God bless you. God bless you. And welcome to another Wednesday evening. Uh, today is um, May 25th, year of our Lord 2022. And welcome to another Wednesday uh, virtual Bible broadcast from the, uh, the New Hope Baptist Church in Covington, Georgia. Well, what can we say? There's been another mass shooting. This time last year, we uh, last year, I'm sorry, this time last week, we were praying uh, for the families and the victims of the recent shootings in Buffalo, New York, where 10 people were killed. And also in, um, what was that? That was uh, Laguana Woods, California, where there was a shooting at a church. Just yesterday, uh, tragically, there's been another mass shooting at an elementary school, the Rob Elementary School in Yovelda. I believe I'm pronouncing it right, Yovelda, Texas. And uh, Yovelde, Texas. 19 kids, third, fourth, second, third, and fourth graders. 19 kids, two adults. So if there ever was a time we need to be praying that the minds and hearts and people, people will be changed. That time is right now. And not only do we need to be praying, we need to be doing all we can uh, to stem this tide of violence. And one of the, way, one of the things we can do in addition to praying is be politically active. Um, our politicians seem to uh, cater to big money and favor that over people's lives. And so we need to be mindful of that when we go to the polls. But let's pray that uh, their hearts will be changed. The Bible says that God, even God rules the king's heart. He can control, he can turn the king's heart. And so we 
pray for the these people who are disturbed, these people who are influenced by uh, evil to do things such as this. We need to be praying. It's time out for playing, church. Let's get serious. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, then the Bible says, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. So let's 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 be about the father's business. We're also praying today. Uh, you know that the, the uh, war is still going on in Ukraine. Uh, other war torn areas all over all over the world. We're still lifting them up in our prayers. As we said earlier, we're lifting up. We're still lifting up the, the families of the people in Buffalo, New York, in Laguana, California, and other places. Uh, right here in the Atlanta area, tragedies all around us. We're lifting up the family of um, of the pastor who was tragically killed the other day as she was trying to help someone. I tell you, evil is just all around us. If there ever was a time, listen, people, if there ever was a time we need to be serious about our relationship with the Lord, that time is right now. We're lifting up all bereaved families. There are many who stood around the graveside today, will stand tomorrow, will stand this coming weekend. We lift up our own. Deacon Robert Clark, as he continued to recuperate, I talked with him yesterday on the phone. He's doing much better, so continue to lift him up in our prayers. Uh, we're lifting up Sister Betty Jackson, Mother Betty Jackson. We're also lifting up Brother and Sister Moses and Doretha Moncrief. I want to remind you now that uh, as we prepare to pray tonight, I want to remind you about our prayer line. That comes every Thursday. Every Thursday will be tomorrow night. Every Thursday is the New Hope Baptist Church prayer line. That's from 8 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. And that line, that number is 774-220-4020. And the access code is 372-1137, followed by the pound sign. We thank God for all of you who have been giving faithfully. Uh, we're in a hybrid situation now where we're in, in we're doing in-service. We're still doing in-service uh, one hour only, mass required. Uh, and then there are those who, who are worshiping with, with us um, through Facebook Live. And we thank God for all of you. And for those of you who are worshiping with us uh, virtually, we want to remind you of our giving options. You can give through PayPal. That's uh, paypal.me forward slash New Hope Cub. Or you can uh, give by give using Giblify. And if you do Giblify, uh, make sure you see uh, once you put in the church physical address, which is 2207 Brown Street, coming to Georgia 30014. Make sure you see a picture of our church. And a small picture of me in the insert. That way you make sure you have the right New Hope Baptist Church. And you can always give by U.S. mail. That's New Hope Baptist Church, P.O. Box 205, Covington, Georgia, 30015. And should you be inclined to share uh, something with me personally or Dr. Miller, uh, my cash app is the... Is the uh, Dollar sign Harold H A R O L D eight eight six zero and Dr Miller's cash app is the dollar sign Holy Holy zero three one five or whatever you do uh, we pray God's blessings upon you and we just pray and hope uh, that you'll be led by the Spirit as you endeavor in doing that. Well, listen, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We have an exciting lesson for you tonight. We're going to be talking about. Uh, the kingdom has come and is coming. We're going to take a look at the now and the not yet aspects of the kingdom of God. 
Well, let's go to the Lord now in prayer, and then we'll be coming forth with our lesson. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you uh, once again for this privilege and this opportunity to just come and just share a word with your people. We pray, oh God, for those who are who are listening um, uh, as we do this live and those who will view it later on, uh, that you would just uh, bless them, oh God, whatever they stand in need of. Uh, we pray for peace in their home. We pray, oh God, for joy in their lives. And we pray for their safety as they go about their daily occupation. Keep them, oh God, in the hollow of your hand. Father, we pray now that you forgive us of our many sins, our sins, our sins of omission as well as our sins of commission. And Father, help us to be your hands and your feet uh, to fulfill the calling for which you created and called us and saved us so that men may look on us and see our good works and glorify you, our Father in heaven. Father, we lift up all these families whose hearts have been shattered in the past several months and years, families in California, families in New York, now families in Texas, and even those God uh, from 10 years ago in uh, Newton, uh, Newtown, Connecticut, as this, as they had a shooting at the at the uh, elementary school in that town, and this bring back memories for them. And we just pray, oh God, that you just comfort them as only you can. And then, Lord, touch our leaders. Such as these politicians, God, as they seem to be uh, staunched and uh, uh, huckering down in their political views and not compromising. And God, we just pray that uh, common sense will prevail, that human decency will prevail. And God, we just pray now, because only you can solve this problem. Only you can solve it. Only you can give us the resolve. Only you can give us the wisdom as to what we need to do. Father, we come now, we pray for the spirit of revelation, that you would just uh, reveal your word to us, reveal your truth to us as we study your word. This we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, God bless you. As we said earlier tonight, we're going to be talking about the kingdom is coming. And the kingdom has come and the kingdom is coming. And that is, uh, we're going to take a look at the now and the not yet aspects of the kingdom of God. So let's uh, go ahead and get into our lesson. Let me just bring it up here. Okay. All right, the kingdom has come and is coming. This is a look at the now and the not yet aspects of the kingdom of God. Now, you may have noticed that for the past several weeks, months, even years, uh, those of us, those of you who've been who are members of our church, and frequent Bible class, you probably noticed that we've been talking quite a bit about the kingdom of God. And the reason we're doing that is uh, that's all Jesus talked about. <laughs> I mean, Jesus, Jesus was obsessed, Jesus was consumed with the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is the ultimate reality. He tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and all the things we need in life, food, housing, shelter, all these things will be added into us as a matter of course. So it behooves us uh, to learn all we can about the kingdom of God. And so tonight, we're going to talk about the aspect of the kingdom being now and not yet. The kingdom has come, and the kingdom is coming. Now, first prayer we learn as children, and we recite it even now, the Lord's Prayer. 
Well, more correctly, it is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. You know that prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then that first petition, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the McDonald idiomatic translation puts it this way. May your kingdom arise. May your will be implemented on earth just as in heaven. Notice, and I, I brought this up because we're not going to find um, passages in scripture where we are encouraged to pray that we might go to heaven. And that, that, that might sound strange. But look at your Bible, not your tradition, not what you always heard, but study the scriptures. And you will not find passages where we are encouraged to pray to go to heaven. But we are encouraged to pray, thy kingdom come. It is a prayer that God's kingdom might be manifested in the earth realm. In fact, if you want to know what the kingdom looks like when it comes, that next phrase stands in apposition. In other words, it's synonymous. What does the kingdom look like? It looks like God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. So let's talk a little bit about this aspect or the, 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 the terminology as it is used in the New Testament. And more specifically, we're talking about the kingdom and we're talking about the phrase kingdom of God. Now in, particularly in the gospels, uh, the term kingdom uh, in the Greek is basilia, basilia. It means royal power, kingship, dominion, rule. And here it is. It is not to be confused with an actual kingdom as in territory, but rather we want to think of it as the right or the authority to rule over a kingdom. So that, you know, that's what you want to think about when you look at the term kingdom, particularly in the Gospels. And I got this from the uh, uh, Lonida, Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament. Um, and he says, it is generally a serious mistake. And we all, we, you know, everybody's made that mistake. I've made that mistake. It's generally a serious mistake to translate the term in Basilea to Theo, Theon, or the kingdom of God, as referring to a particular area in which God rules. So he, when he, when we, what he's saying is that when, when the Bible mentions, most of the time when the Bible mentions the kingdom of God, it's not talking about a location. It's not talking about an area where God rules. He says, the meaning of this phrase in the New Testament involves not a particular place or special period of time, but rather the fact of ruling. And so expressions such as to enter the kingdom of God thus do not refer to going to heaven, but should be understood as accepting God's rule or welcoming God's rule over. Prime example of this is when Jesus is engaged in conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter three. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, except a man be born again, born from above, the uh, word is unknown, born from above, he cannot see. Now, he's not talking about, notice he said, he didn't say he will not see. He said he cannot see. He's not talking about 
seeing the pearly gates. He's talking about perceiving and understanding the kingdom of God. And Paul talks about this later on when he says that uh, those who are uh, spiritually, not spiritually discerned, cannot discern the things of the spirit. So Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born from above, except a man have the spirit of God, have spiritual insight, he cannot see, he cannot comprehend the kingdom of God. And then later on, uh, later on, he says, except man be born again, he cannot enter. And that word enter, as he just said uh, in our text, in our earlier part, he says, does not refer to going to heaven, but he cannot, he's talking about accepting God's rule. He cannot experience, he cannot experience the kingdom of God in its present day aspect. He cannot enjoy the benefits of the kingdom of God. He cannot enter into that relationship of God's rule. So what does it look like when the kingdom comes? Jesus said something, he, he's engaged, he was engaged in a conversation uh, with the scribes and Pharisees, and they were accusing him of um, casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub or the devil. And Jesus says, if I do it by his power, what power are you doing? Are you casting out demons by? He says, but, this is Matthew 12, 28, but if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Note now, he says that the kingdom, if I cast out demons, by the power of the Spirit of God, then that is an indication that the kingdom of God has come upon you, has arrived. Note again, he's not talking about going to heaven. He's talking about the rule, the reign, the sovereign authority of God. Okay? And Jesus he demonstrated the presence of the kingdom by working miracles. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if you were to look up the word miracle or miracles in the Greek, the word that is used would be translated as mighty works. Mighty works. And these mighty works were done, were done to demonstrate the presence of the kingdom of God. If you were to look up the term miracle, the Greek word behind it, in John's gospel, you find a word called simeon, which means signs. So in the, in the synoptic gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're mighty works. In John, there are signs, okay? And the major sign was the casting out of demons. The casting out of demons. Now, you know, today, there are those who insist upon rebuking demons, but that's not biblical. Jesus didn't, you know, it wasn't a matter of rebuking, he cast them out. In fact, uh, James, there's a, there's a passage in James, I think it's James, where it says that uh, we shouldn't be rebuking because, because that only God can do that. So he says, in Luke, which is the parallel passage to the passage in Matthew, he says, but if it's by the finger of God, notice in Matthew, he says, the spirit of God. In Luke, he says, the finger of God. If it's by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Again, the 
kingdom's presence is demonstrated by the casting out of demons, the overcoming of evil. So the kingdom of God is present whenever and wherever evil is cast out by God's power. Now, remember, we're talking about the present day aspect or the right now aspects of the kingdom of God. And the reason why we're doing this is because traditionally we've always postponed the kingdom until the end of time when everything's wrapped up. And then we say we enter the kingdom. No, my friend, you're either in the kingdom or out of the kingdom right now. Colossians 1.13 says that he has transferred us, those of us who are saved, he has transferred us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta renew your mind, you gotta repent, and you gotta think of yourself as already being in the kingdom, not, not when you die, not at judgment, not at the end of time, but you're in the kingdom of God right now. You're either in the kingdom of God or you're not in the kingdom of God at this very present moment. The kingdom of God comes is demonstrating power. Uh, this is after uh, Peter makes his speech at Caesarea Philippi. And when Jesus said, whom do men say that I, the son of man, I am? Jesus said, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Okay. And then after that, he says, uh, truly, truly, I say, there are some of you standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come in power. And of course, uh, he could be perhaps talking about the transfiguration because right after that, they go up into the mountain. Uh, he, along with Peter, James, and John, they go up into the mountain. He's transfigured before them. They see Moses and they see Elijah, kingdom demonstrating power. Or he could be talking about the resurrection after his uh, passion, after his crucifixion, God raised him from the dead. Or it may be a future reference, it may have been a reference to Pentecost, or maybe it was all three. But the point is that the kingdom of God, when it comes in his presence, there's the power of God that's present. And we need that today uh, among Christian circles, among people who claim to know God it seems as if we're so impotent, so powerless. And it may be because, I think it's because uh, we have not tapped into the resource of the presence of the kingdom of God. The evidence of the kingdom's presence is, comes, is, is also in the preaching and healing. Uh, listen to what Jesus says to his disciples in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. He says, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils. That's King James, more properly, uh, demons, and to cure diseases. Nobody had, they had power to do, the power he gave them, the authority he gave them over demonic forces. He gave them power to cure diseases, okay? And he sent them, he says, the Bible says he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He says later on in Luke chapter 10, verses eight and nine, whenever you enter a town and they receive a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you, heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So the kingdom's presence is manifested in preaching and healing. The kingdom of God's presence is manifested in preaching 
healing, casting out of demonic forces. Now, the presence of the kingdom of God from the time of Jesus' arrival, even up until this day, it is in what is called mystery form. Mystery form. It has not been manifested fully yet. The Pharisees demanded of him one day when the kingdom of God should come. He answered them and said, the kingdom of God comes not with observation. In other words, you can't see it. It's, it's not, it's not, it's not with a, 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 a fanfare, you know. You can't see it's over there and over here or whatever. He says, it doesn't happen that way. And then again, he, he's talking about a parable. He talks about parables of the kingdom in, 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 in uh, Matthew chapter 13. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. And let me just say this now. When we talk about the kingdom of God and we talk about the kingdom of heaven, they're synonymous terms. They mean the same thing. There's no difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Now, some have, some have attempted to, to make a difference, but if you read the, the passages, the, the, the gospels carefully, you'll see when Matthew, Jesus, the, the, the dominant term is the kingdom of uh, kingdom of, of uh, heaven, because Matthew's a Jewish gospel, and they avoided uh, the name God out of respect, and so you have kingdom of heaven. You find a parallel passage in Mark or Luke. Same, same scenario, same exact incident, but in say, instead of saying kingdom of heaven, they will say kingdom of God. And so we, that's, that's, that's how we know that they were used interchangeably synonymous terms. Now, I want to talk about this treasure hidden in the field. He says the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like unto treasure hidden in a field. And then he talks about uh, a man who's working in the field. He stumbles upon this treasure. Uh, he hides it again. He goes and sells all he has so that he might buy the field, so that he might be the legal owner of the, of, uh, the treasure. Now, here's my point, though. This is why I'm bringing it up in this particular context for our lesson tonight. The kingdom of God is all around us, but yet it is hidden to those who do not have ears to hear and do not have eyes to see, to those who are not spiritually discerned, the kingdom is not manifested. Just like the treasure that was hidden in that field, there were people walking in that field, there were people uh, working in that field, there are people walking by that field, unaware that the treasure was in the field. Every day, people are going about their daily occupation, doing their daily business, unaware of the presence of the kingdom of God. And if you're unaware of the presence of the kingdom of God, then naturally you can't take advantage and you can't benefit from the power of the present kingdom of God. And I think this is where a lot of uh, quote unquote Christian people are missing out today because we have our, we have our hopes of kingdom on layaway. Something's gonna happen after we die. Something's gonna happen at the culmination of time. And we don't understand the present day aspect of the kingdom of God. And so a lot of things we go through we don't have to, but we do it needlessly because of our ignorance of the present day aspect of the kingdom of God. But it's all around us. And we need to learn how to tap into it. Jesus says to those Pharisees, he says, it's internal. He says, behold, 
the kingdom of God is within you. Now, there, if you read the commentary, you know, he said, well, uh, um, the Greek word is within. The Greek word is naturally translated within. But some of your some of your English will have will say among you, because they they reason there's no way in the world Jesus would say to those wicked Pharisees that the kingdom of God was within them. Well, I think Jesus was talking in general terms. I, I don't think he was saying specifically in them. He was just simply saying that the kingdom of God is internal. It's within a person. It's not outside here or there, wherever. It's within, you know, and this is the way life works. Life works from the inside out. The reason why a lot of people today are 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 uh, a day late. Let me put it this way: a day late and a dollar short in life is because they seek to live life from the outside in. But life does not work from the outside in. Life works from the inside out. It's internal, and then it flows out to the external. For instance, uh, everything, everything in life starts with a thought, an idea. That's internal. Everything in life is based uh, or is produced by the spirit. That's internal. Everything you can see, touch, feel, Handle was uh, existed in the spiritual realm before it existed in the physical or material realm. In fact, if it did not exist first in the spiritual realm, it will never. It would have never been manifested in the physical realm. And so, what I'm trying to say is that we need to learn how to reorientate our thinking. Because, you know, we naturally think that what we can see, what we can feel, what we can taste is, is really real. But actually, those are just shadows of reality. The really real occurred before then. And what we're experiencing, what we're enjoying in the physical realm is just the, the shadow or the afterthought or the residue of what has already happened in the spiritual realm. Now, this is important for you to understand because if you're going to solve a problem, uh, you can't solve it in the physical realm because when you try to solve your problem in the physical realm, you are not touching the problem. You are just touching the symptoms. The problem is in the spiritual realm. And so you must deal with it in the spirit first. And that's how the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God is internal. The kingdom of God is spiritual. It's within. And it flows from the inside out. That's all Jesus was saying. Not necessarily that, was within, that it was within those wicked Pharisees. He's just saying it's within people in general, the people who were able to understand and perceive it. Now, here's my point. I want, I want to emphasize that the kingdom of God is now and later. Uh, this is after the incident with the uh, rich young ruler. Uh, the Bible says he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus began to talk about how hard it was for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Not go to heaven, but enter into the kingdom of God, because if you're going to enter into the kingdom of God, then God is your source, not your riches. You have to trust in God and not in your riches. And so Peter said, look, we, Lord, we, we, we left all to follow you. What's in it for us? And Jesus said, truly I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or land for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. That's the now aspect. Houses, brothers, sisters and mothers, children and lands with persecution. And in the age to come, eternal life. That's the later aspect. 
but many who will be who are first will be last and the last will be first. And I'm emphasizing this because, you know, most times it's sad to say it, uh, but, uh, but too many of us will die uh, without ever fully realizing the potential that God placed in us, without ever really taking full advantage of, of the blessings God has already blessed us with. We keep asking for blessings, but the blessings we seek are already given in the kingdom. See, we don't need any more blessings. We just need to know how to access the bless the blessings we already have, and that's within the kingdom. That's why it's so important that we know how the kingdom functions, that we know how to operate, and that we recognize uh, how how it does that, how the kingdom does that. So is here and not yet. And this is this is a picture of an eclipse. Hope you can see this. And what it is, is that you notice that uh, in the eclipse, one body is gradually overshadows the other body. But both of them are present. And so we want to look at it like this uh, in Philippians chapter. 3 verse 20 uh, Paul says he's talking to the Philippians he says but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior the Lord Jesus Christ now you have to understand the context in which Paul is saying that who's Paul talking to Paul is talking to the Philippians Philippi was a Roman colony in Macedonia and although the people did not live in Rome, they conducted their lives, they conducted their affairs as if they did. In other words, every colony, not just Philippi, but every colony of Rome was set up to be a duplicate or a replica of Rome. And the people who lived in those colonies, no matter where, no matter where it was geographically, they were considered as Roman citizens and had all the rights and privileges of the people who lived in Rome. This is important for you to understand that concept. So as citizens of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, we are to live on earth as if we are already living in the eternal kingdom quit talking about what you're going to do when you get to heaven how you're going to act when you get to heaven you need to be acting that way now whatever you're going to do you need to be doing that now you see because if you don't internalize that concept then you're going to miss out note the wording of the text the ones whose citizenship in, was in heaven uh, was not necessarily longing to go there. But they were awaiting their Lord who would come from there. And their Lord who would come from there, their master who would come from there, or the representative who would come from Rome would set everything right. The point is, and the point was, was for Philippi to be a mini replica of Rome. That was the purpose of the colony. That is the purpose. That is the rationale behind the prayer we, we have been instructed to pray. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's God's will that whatever is happen, happening in heaven to be duplicated and replicated on earth. Earth was meant to be an image, a replica of heaven. And that's what that's what the presence of the kingdom. Now, yes, it's flawed. Yes, it doesn't look that way right now. But eventually it will. And that's what we should be doing. In other words, listen, uh, if the world wants to know what's going on in heaven, it ought to be able to look at, 
Look at the people of God, the local church, the local church, wherever it is in that community, should be an outpost to the kingdom of heart, our kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. And people ought to be able to look in that local church and catch a glimpse of heaven. That's what kingdom power, that's what kingdom presence is all about. We have an earthly residence. But we have a heavenly citizenship. Now, those of you who frequent Bible class might, might remember this. Uh, these two circles here. They represent two realms of living. The first realm is the present evil age. This is a time in which we live. The second circle represents the age to come. And that is when the kingdom of God is in full manifestation. Time when the, the lion will lay down with the lamb. The time when there'll be peace on earth. The time when, when there'll be no more death. The time when there'll be no more heartbreak. Okay. Now. As you can see from this diagram, and I wasn't able to do it uh, with this, but if I could, I would have uh, put a little, you know, you got this, you got this uh, circle here that, that overlaps. I would have done a little, little dot so you can see that the, the circle behind, the white circle behind the orange circle is complete. And if I did the little dot there, to complete that circle, that 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 section that overlaps, where the two ages overlap, is is where we live right now. This is that's the stress zone. That's the stress zone. And it's stressful because when we live in that in that area. We are to live in this present evil age as if we were already living in the age to come. And that's why I said earlier, don't, you know, whatever you plan, think you're going to be doing in heaven, you need to be doing that right now. Praising God, do it now. See? So we're living in, the, we're in the present evil age. But those who are members of the kingdom, those who are citizens of the kingdom, note the arrows, the arrow that's pushing the, the white circle in one direction, the arrow is pushing the orange circle in the opposite direction so that they overlap. The kingdom is moving back into us, into our time. And that's where you have the overlap. When Jesus came, that represents that 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 stress zone. And this is why, my friend, as a child of God, you are under tremendous stress because you're living in this present evil age. But you've been called upon, and yes, you've been empowered, though you may not recognize it though you may not take advantage of it, but if you are truly a child of God, you have been empowered to live in this present evil age just as if you were already living in the age to come. It takes, it takes, it takes the renewing of your mind. That's why Jesus said repent, <laughs> you know. When Jesus talked about repent, he wasn't talking about just necessarily being sorry for your sin. He was talking about change your mind, change the way you think, reorientate your thinking. Because you're in the present evil age, but you're to think and to live. You're to function as people of God according to the standards of the age to come, the kingdom of God. 
Now, here's where, I, here's where we are with modern Christianity. Uh, I call it the modern Christian layaway. Because most of modern Christians, most modern Christians live as if their salvation is on a layaway plan. When I get to heaven, I'm going to sing and shout. When I get to heaven, this, when I get to heaven, God going to fix it after a while. See, everything is already always in the future. They expect victory only in the world to come. But the good news of the gospel <laughs> is that not only can we have victory in the world to come, but we can have victory in the present evil age. That's what we talked about a few, few slides ago about the power of the kingdom, the presence of the kingdom. It is power for living now. You see, in traditional Christianity, the hope is only in going to heaven when they die. But you see, what God has given us through the kingdom is even greater than that. And because they are uh, because of this mentality, uh, they're not actively engaged in transacting kingdom business until he comes. There's a parable Jesus talked about. It's a parallel of the parable of the talents. Uh, I think in Luke's gospel it's called the parable of the pounds. Uh, but Luke 19 and 13 says he called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds and said to them, occupy till I come. The word occupy in the Greek means to transact business. And what we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be doing kingdom business until he comes. Not just sitting around, twilling our thumbs, waiting on the rapture. <laughs> no, we are supposed to be actively being salt in light in this world. And I might afraid, my friends, that the attitude of most Christians that I know of is that, hey, this world's going to hell in a handbasket. Ain't nothing we can do. We just gonna hang on to Jesus come. And we've allowed the enemy to win by default. And that is not what God left us here to do. He left us here to dominate in his name. There again, Genesis chapter one, verses 26 to 28. Let them have dominion. See, all this is about fulfilling God's original intent. And God's original intent was that for the kingdom of heaven to be on earth. And that's what God intended in the beginning will come to fulfillment in the end. Right now, it's in the process. It's in mystery form. But we need to be engaged in that process instead of just twilling our thumbs and waiting, waiting, hoping for the great escape of the rapture. That's not biblical. He says, occupy, do business. Jesus says, upon this rock, I'll build my church. He says, the gates of hell should not prevail. Listen, do you know what gates are? Gates are defensive in nature. What Jesus was saying that Hades or the evil forces would not be able to withstand the onslaught of the church. The church is not supposed to be on defensive. The church is supposed to be on the offense. The church is not supposed to be passive in this world. The church is supposed to be active, actively engaging. How do we how do we break down the enemy territory by preaching the gospel of the kingdom and getting as many people saved as possible and getting them to get other folks saved? That is how the kingdom of, of darkness is diminished. What would have happened if that young man just just, just recently yesterday, if that young man 
who killed those uh, 19 children and two adults who went to that school shooting. What would what do you think would have happened if he had been reached with the gospel and he was saved? I know what would have happened. He definitely wouldn't have shot at the school. <laughs> Those 19 kids would be alive today. Those two adults would be alive today. All these mass murderers, all these mass shooters, all the people doing evil, if they had been reached with the gospel correctly, see, and if their lives have been changed, then we wouldn't be going through some of the hurt and turmoil we're going through today. See, that's what it's all about. So we, we got to reorientate what we think about the plan of salvation. Is not a heavenly retirement plan. See, people think that when they get to heaven, they're just going to sit down and rest. You know, you're not going to be sitting down, lounging around, and, and you know, like you had a retirement resort. No. The Bible says that we will reign with him, we will rule with him forever. Work's going to be going on. Kingdom business is going to be going on. Our salvation is not a, a, a fire insurance policy. You know, we uh, back in the day, the main thing that, you know, they try to scare folk, you know, you got to be saved. You don't want to go to hell. Well, that was kind of disingenuous because salvation is more than just fire insurance. Because the, the scriptures teach that we are saved, not just so we don't go to hell, but rather we are saved so that we might do the foreordained good works God created us to do. We are saved so that we might fulfill our original intent, which is to have dominion, to exercise dominion. That's why we're saved. It's all about the kingdom, people. All about the kingdom. So the traditional problem is this. And here's where we are. Let's see if I can get this out of the way. So I can read this. The traditional problem is that Christianity has emphasized the latter or the later aspect of the kingdom. I mean, we, we've done a great job in presenting uh the idea, the concept of heaven after death. But we pay little or even no attention to the now aspect of the kingdom. And consequently, modern Christianity has done a great job in preparing people to die, but has done a very poor job of preparing people to live. And one thing I've learned that you got to do before you die, you got to live. Jesus said, I've come that they may have life. And he wasn't talking about life after death. See, they may have life. He wants you to be an overcomer. He wants you to reflect him in the earth. Can, can you see God walking around depressed and, and dejected and, you know, just giving up with both his hands like you see so many so-called Christians today? No, that's not, that's not God's will. That's not what God wants us to be, wants to be like. Paul says we're more than conquerors. With him who loved us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. John says, greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. You are an overcomer. You are a son of God. You are a child of the king. You are in the kingdom of God 
right now. And that's what Jesus preached. Jesus was obsessed. He was consumed by this concept of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And primarily he was consumed about it in his present aspect. Jesus, Jesus really never talked that much about going to heaven. But he talked a lot about the presence of the kingdom of God. In fact, in Matthew 4.17, his initial statement Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That that statement uh, is was the cornerstone of the gospel he preached. It was it was his uh, it was his uh, uh, announcement of what his ministry was all about, what his life was all about. Nearly every parable Jesus told was a parable to illustrate what the kingdom of God is like, what the kingdom of heaven is like, Matthew chapter 13, all those parables, the kingdom of heaven is like this, the kingdom of heaven is like that. Every miracle, we just talked about it earlier, every miracle he performed was to demonstrate the power of the presence of the kingdom. Listen, the kingdom is here right now. And because the kingdom is here right now, I'm casting out demons. Because the kingdom of God is present right now, I'm healing the sick. Now, Jesus preached the kingdom of God, and he commanded his followers to preach the kingdom of God. But the problem today, my friend, is that the church does not preach the kingdom as Jesus preached it. And because of that, people have ridden the church off as irrelevant to the issues of real life. Most people go to church, a lot of people go to church with what I call a, a nightclub mentality. They don't go to church and they don't think of the church as, as, as being relevant in life. You know, they go to have a good time. They go to forget about their problem. You know, it's like a drug. Uh, uh, um, I forget who it was, but uh, one of those guys uh, said that, you know, religion was the opiate of the people. And it is for some people. People who don't know about it, and people who don't realize, who don't recognize and understand the kingdom of God. Because the church promotes primarily a pie in the sky only when you die by and by theology it says very little about overcoming power the overcoming power of the kingdom of god that's available to you right now and so the church overall lacks the spiritual power to transact or to do kingdom business and i've said it before and i'll say it again and i keep on saying it Yes, there's evil in the world. Yes, there's a lot going on in the world. That's, that's, that's wrong. But some of the stuff that's going on, it should, it, 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 you know, he said it would, we would have tribulation. But I believe that some of, is, some of it is exacerbated by the fact that we are allowing evil to win by default. We're not putting up a fight. Because we, we have not, we we are so heavily invested that we've ridden off this world by default, not realizing that we're here to be stewards. <laughs> we're here to exercise dominion. Because the kingdom of God is now and later. We talk a lot about later, but we don't talk much about now. Not one or the other, it's both. It's now and later. Is heaven? Yes. 
but it's also now. And that's all I'm saying. I'm not denying the heaven. I'm just advocating that the real gospel says we can have heaven then and the kingdom now. And so we need to repent, my friend. We need to repent. Repent. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, he wasn't, you know, he was, I don't think he was talking about, you know, just being sorry for your sins and, you know, changing your life and, you know, as far as all this kind of stuff. We, we talk about repent so you can go to heaven. That's not the message Jesus preached. He said, repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, he's saying you got to change the way you think. You got to change your, your concept. Quit thinking of the kingdom as coming by and by in the sky, by and by when you die. But think of it as a present reality and govern yourselves accordingly. When we were kids, you know, uh, when mama was home, we acted a certain way. Not that we were rats or something when she was gone, but we respected her presence. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about in this passage. Repent. Change your, change your thinking. You know, respect the presence of the kingdom of God. Act like it's here because it is here. It's now. So we must quit thinking of the kingdom only in terms of the sweet by and by. And recognize, preach, and teach the present aspects of the kingdom as well. Not just one or the other, both. Not just later. Not just now, but now and later. That's how we must preach the kingdom, as now and later. And so as we conclude, my friend, I want to share this with you. You see, the focus of most modern Christian preaching has been on the cross. But let me just give you this before I leave you. This may come a shock to be as it comes as a shock to you. But Jesus never preached the cross. The only time he mentioned the cross was in the context of private conversations with his disciples. He didn't preach the cross, he preached the kingdom. And we've been led to believe that the cross is you know, that the, that the cross is the gospel. That's not what. Not, but according to Jesus, the gospel predates the cross. <laughs> he was preaching the gospel before he went to the cross. Now, while the cross does play a considerable role in our redemption, our salvation, yes, it's important. But according to Jesus, the essence of the good news or the, the essence of the gospel at its core is the arrival, the good news of the arrival of the kingdom of God. That's so why I conclude with that. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching, the gospel of the kingdom of God. What did that gospel say? The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. What is the gospel? The good news. What are, you, what are we to believe? We are to repent, change the way we think, change our mind, quit thinking of the gospel, or the, or, or the kingdom only as future. we we'll reorientate our minds, reorientate our thinking to understand that it's now and later. That's what we need to believe. And when we believe that, my friend, when we understand that even the term Lord, Jesus is the Lord, that's kingdom. See? It's all about a relationship with the Lord of the kingdom. And that's why he tells us, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, everything you need will be added 
unto you. Well, God bless you, my friend. I pray and hope that uh, again, that uh, this um, has been a blessing to you. And listen, if it's been a blessing to you, it'll be a blessing to someone else. So share this on your timeline. Pray and hope that you'll be with us tomorrow night uh, in our call-in prayer line. Continue to pray for one another. Continue to pray for this world. And continue to do what all that you can do as God leads you to make this world a better place. Because listen, that's all we got. Yes, we go to heaven when we die. But if you read the Bible correctly, you will discover that eventually we will be back. And heaven will be on earth. And the kingdom will be manifested fully in the future. And what is now in mystery form will be in concrete form forever. And we will reign with him forever. That is the good news of the gospel, that we've been redeemed so that we might be all that God created us to be and do all that he created us to do in his original intent. God bless you. Until next time is our prayer.